Okay, so for today's video um, or lesson, what I'm going to try to do is work through key ideas in Richard Third and look at how ideas lead to thematic statements. The difference between them, why have that sort of statement rather than um, a one word idea or potentially view it as a one word theme, um, a simple task to do with the themes and um, then a little bit of a prattle um, from me about one theme in particular. So first what I want you to do is to record um, key ideas that you see in the play. So ideas are just, they can be one word, they can be um, a short sentence, they can be um, yeah, two or three words, whatever you want, they don't have to be amazing. So when you think about King Richard III as a play, Richard III, um, and you have watch the videos again and you've read through the plot and you've got a bit more of an awareness and you've recapped it, what are some of the ideas that you see? So I pause the video, take a moment and write them down and then I will share some of mine. Okay, so assuming you've got something down, um, what you're gonna do is listen to me talk about them and add to your list with some of mine um, and some of them you might see that you've got the same thing or um, the same thing in a slightly different way. So these are the themes, sorry, the ideas that I see present in the text. So I have kind of summarized um, with these ones, but I know that there are others that we've discussed in class, for example, betrayal, but I see betrayal fitting well under good and evil power manipulation. So I sort of view these ones as ideas that are kind of umbrella terms, meaning that um, if you've got a question or a statement that leads itself to think about one theme or one idea, um, these ones work really well, kind of as I said, an umbrella term that you could put a lot under. So manipulation, and that's really powerful in the text. So manipulation, ultimately we look to Richard for that, but he isn't the sole provider of manipulation. And when we look at ideas, we're obviously looking at where they're seen, how they're seen, why they're seen. Um, and the manipulation that we see in the text is largely done through language, which is a really cool point of difference and something that can be expanded on really nicely to lead to high level responses. Power as a concept is present in the text and it's associated with greed, insecurity, paranoia, um, all those different sides of it. The supernatural, so this is an idea that is present in the text um, and we see this largely with things to link with the divine right. Um, and this idea that things are meant to be the way they are because there is a higher power. So it's sort of got a slight religious tone to it as well. Good and evil. So this differentiation, and that kind of links to our wider thematic study of the unlikable character um, and what makes them unlikable. And so that links in with this idea of good and evil, which is obviously subjective and would be different at the time of writing through the time of reading that we are now, obviously many, 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 many years later. And lastly, family is my idea. So family um, and the connotations we have of that and the loyalty that we have with that contrasted to the betrayal and manipulation and the evil that comes with that in Richard III. So what I'd like you to do is to jot down those ideas and add to your list, and then we'll move on to a thematic statement in a moment. Okay, so um, what we need to work with is this idea of ideas versus themes. So there is a slight distinction. We kind of use them um, interchangeably as if they're synonymous, but there is a, a slight distinction, and that's what we're going to talk about. So ideas tend to be a word um, or a couple of words as opposed to a sentence. So looking at that, ideas, just jotted down, generalized broad. Themes. Um, uh, kind of more like a generalized statement or phrase. They don't include any characters or conflicts or plot specific details, but they have more of a lesson or um, they take what is the word and they make it into a sentence. So they've got more specific um, development, kind of almost like a moral or a lesson. So, for example, if you studied a text in uh, year nine, you did remember the Titans, you knew it was a theme of racism. Racism isn't a theme. A theme is racism can be overcome or racism should not define or racism is a negative experience for all involved. You know, so it's just taking that from a one word into a developed thematic statement. 
why bother? So it works a bit of a, as a bit of a thesis. Um, it allows for reflection. It provides a bit more of a narrowed focus for reflections as well. Um, it's quite nice having those broad terms, but um, if you can narrow them down, it shows further engagement with the text, which is part of the marking criteria. Um, it can help direct your discussion a little bit further. It prompts more reflection on your behalf, and it makes you sound smarter, for sure. So to prove that point, um, if you look at the two sentences below, one in blue and one in yellow, you'll kind of see the difference. So this event shows the theme of power because versus this event shows the theme absolute power corrupts absolutely because. Um, so automatically it elevates the level of reflection that you've had. So you've not just said there's power, but you've decided that power corrupts absolutely. So you have provided um, a bigger stance to stand on. If you're looking at level three analysis, um, having marked the exams, uh, I know that criteria quite well. Um, and here, by making that statement, you are providing a standpoint. If you're saying there's power, that's not really creating a standpoint. If you're saying power corrupts absolutely, you're creating a standpoint. You're saying this is what I believe and this is what I believe the text shows. And that's already taking a step into developing an argument, which is part of your marking criteria. So that's going to help you. OK. So what I want you to do is look at our themes, which is meant to say ideas, our ideas from the previous slide and how we can make them into sentences. So if you've got a list of ideas that's like 10 ideas long, pick five of them. Um, so if you look at okay, what we had, we had five of them. So if you've got none of them, pick five. If you have lots of them, pick five. Um, pick five that you think work best with your understanding of the text. So if my five don't work well for you, then don't pick them. Pick the ones that you kind of understand. So pick those and try and make them into sentences. How could they build? Okay, And I will go through some of them, so don't feel too alarmed if you're feeling sick. And here's my one. So what you can do if you're feeling completely stuck is pause the video and just copy mine down or use them as a starting point. Um, copy one of them down and maybe try and work with your other ones yourself. So how to make the idea into a sentence. So you're thinking, well, I see manipulation in the text, but how do I see it? I see manipulation through language. So I can make a sentence on that, which I haven't done here because I forgot about it. Um, you might look at manipulation and think, why is it done? Um, and then use that to build the sentence. So manipulation will always be a tool of those who desire power. Very firm statement. Um, I've created a stance there and it would work with a lot of events in the text. So it's a bit wordy. The next two are shorter um, and you do want it to be a little bit shorter because if you're writing it out every, you know, third or fourth sentence in an essay, um, it can get a little bit painful. So another one that I had was manipulation. Um, those who are powerful manipulate, and manipulation has many victims. Um, I like that one about language, though. So maybe if you're doing manipulation um, as a idea and making it into a thematic statement, do one about language, because I forgot about that. Power. Um, power corrupts those who have it. Nice and straightforward. Power drives people to do radical acts. I don't know if I like radical and X as my words, but I couldn't think of anything else. So that's what I went with. Uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's not a me saying. <laughs> that is a well-known saying, but it works here and it's not too cliched. So you could still use it. And then power is never secure. The only reason that it was in blue is that I came up with it later and I didn't want to move, ruin my alternate color schemes. So that's why that's in blue. It's not dramatically more important. Uh, the supernatural. The supernatural is always present. Um, humans have to submit to the supernatural. So that one's kind of seen in a play when um, Richard plays with that. He plays with the divine right. So the divine right was the assumption that the royals who were in those positions should were there because God chose it. And so by him um, manipulating that, he is going against the supernatural. So it's kind of um, contrast that statement. So these thematic statements don't always have to be correct. You can discuss and argue and say that there is an extent that they're present. Um, good and evil, the conflict between good and evil, simple. The blurred lines of good and evil. So that one would work really well when you think about um, Richard's character and to what extent he is a terrible character. Because there are almost always character statements and they often link to things like them being sympathetic or heroic um, and 
considering good and evil is really important. And also that's not Richard limited. Um, Lady Anne, she went off with him, you know, that's kind of evil. Um, even if she claimed that she had no other way, it's still not the best representation of her character. Or Buckingham, who's like effectively Richard's little bitch boy, he does so many bad things. Um, do we cast him in the same light as Richard? Maybe not, because Richard's told him to do it. But sometimes he takes it on himself to do it. So, yeah, that one's quite a good one. Um, and I kind of struggle with the family one. I know it's one that you'll see online as a theme or an idea. Um, family does not define loyalty. That could be rephrased to be something better. So what I want you to do is to pick five of your five of your ideas and write thematic statements. If you haven't already done that, um, if you have done that and you like mine, add them to them. If you are completely stuck and everything is terrible, then just pause the video and copy mine. Okay, next activity. Dun -dun -dun. Okay, so what you're going to do is pick three of your five. So you'll see that we're narrowing down slowly but surely. This is just to make sure that you have an awareness of wider themes. But um, there is always going to be one theme that you have a greater affinity for um, and you can discuss with greater ease or see. And it might be easier for you to see or you have more of an interest in discussing it because it flicks something on intellectually within you. So I quite like the power and the manipulation and the good and the evil, personally. Um, but obviously everyone's going to be different. And just because as a teacher, I prefer certain ones doesn't mean that you have to go for those ones. Um, they're just the ones that personally I see and they stimulate me a little bit. So um, what you're going to do is take three of those ideas, list them as a heading, um, and then go and find three or four events that help to show those themes. So look back at plot summaries, grids, um, key event notes, all that sort of stuff. And uh, yeah, three or four events. So for example, manipulation, um, an event that shows that is at the beginning when uh, Richard manipulates Clarence into thinking that he is gonna help him. Then you go into act one, scene two, manipulation. I see this when Richard woos Lady Anne. Okay, it's already two events, so if you are lazy, you can do that one. Let me come up with one more. So you're just going to go back and you're going to do that. And then when you have done that, pick one theme. So pick the one that tickles your pickle the best um, and that you can see the easiest. And for that theme, you go back to the event and for each event, you read through that scene again. I know, painful. Okay, and you're going to add two to three quotes for that event. Um, if you're really struggling, go online and try and look up those events and find key quotes from it from that. But really it's level three and you've got to do some work. So the more detailed these notes are now, um, the better your revision notes are when you have to come back to this text in November. Okay, so those are the activities. Pick three themes, list events that help to show that theme, then go back, pick one theme um, and add two to three quotes. So when I'm saying theme, you can go with one of those thematic statements. The broadest one is the best one, so just pick one and do it that way. Um, and hopefully it should be easy enough for you. Cool. That's basically the main activity for the day. Um, the remainder of this video is just going to be me kind of trying to get you to think about a little bit further on those themes, so kind of an extension um, from just doing the default note creation and to actually reflecting on the themes, which is what you need to do to get above a basic achieved. All right, so um, if you've done those activities or you just want to watch the video in full and then go back and do those activities, um, this is what you need to do as a next step. So being able to identify a theme in a text um, is a basic step. You've been doing that since year nine. Being able to find events that do it, something you've been doing since year nine. Um, finding quote or evidence, something that you've been doing since year nine. But the thing that makes it um, more meaningful is obviously it's got to connect with whatever your statement is that you're answering for your essay. But uh, preparation for that is to think beyond just the this shows this because um, and somewhat linking it to a statement that you're given to discuss in the exam. Um, and to be able to do that means to evaluate the theme and look at it um, beyond just here is where I see it, but also what else can I see or gain from that? So when you evaluate a theme, you pick one and you work through it. So I've just copied the ones there 
for the idea of power um, because as I said before I quite like that one I also like manipulation and good and evil so if I had more time and more inclination I would do this for all of them um, but I'm not going to so um, when I'm looking at that what I would look at is which theme offers me the most to work with um, and I would say maybe that power corrupts those who have it or the much nicer fancier cooler way of saying absolute power corrupts absolutely so that was my theme that I was working with um, first I'm going to say when do I see these theme when do I see this theme best um, and so that's those events that you came up with before okay that's a that's a really big surface first step but then what I want to look at is do those themes show it in a different way so when I look at absolute power corrupts absolutely I look at Richard's soliloquy at the beginning of the play. I look at Richard's interactions with Lady Anne, his soliloquy following, things like that. Does it show a difference? So when I see Richard in, I think it's Act 4, Scene 2, and he cuts Buckingham off because Buckingham hesitates, does that show me that the corruption of power in a different way to when he woos Lady Anne? Yes, ultimately they're all done for the same outcome, but um, he doesn't owe loyalty to Lady Anne but he should probably owe loyalty to his right-hand man. Um, so I can see that, that that power corrupts absolutely in a different way um, because the, the corruption is so much worse when it is done to a friend. And then from there, I reflect on that and think, well, what does that show me? That friendship is the most important thing and that, that is you can be corrupt, um, but only to an extent, and then that discovers, um, that allows me to evaluate the limits of something, which is what you are being asked to do when you come up with an argument, which is arguing to an extent. So that's why it's important to think about how it's shown in a different way. If it's shown in the same way throughout, can you see a development? Can you see it ramping up a bit? So um, I would say that Richard's corruption does ramp up. Okay, so he betrays his family, but he doesn't really like his family, so that's not a big step. Um, he woos this woman, that's not a big step. He starts to, he betrays his best friend. Um, he gets anyone that, when he gets Hastings killed, that shows the level of paranoia when he talks about wanting to marry his damn niece. It steps up a bit. Like his corruption and desire for power knows nearly no bounds. Um, so that goes on with the idea of how it theme develops. See, I said that at the beginning, this is going to be a prattle. Um, how would this theme have been viewed at the time of the writing? Uh, so that's really important to consider, and that's one of the benefits of doing a Shakespearean text, is that you have such a different historical context at the time of writing, um, such a different attitude to, to power and those interactions. So those interactions with Lady Anne, as I've mentioned in class before, she kind of had, there was no benefit. Her husband was dead. Um, she didn't have that connection to his family because the dad was dead too. So she kind of needed something. So at the time, we would have just said, God, Lady Anne's terrible. And we kind of say that now. Um, but it would have been even less um, appreciation for her as a person because she was a woman. And we know that Richard doesn't like women. But also um, the society at the time was not that crazy about women, even though they had a queen in charge. So um, it's important to consider that. And what would have been seen perhaps as worse was the attempt of him to betray the divine right. Uh, so that's why that power is going to be viewed differently at the time of writing. And that's what the benefit of a Shakespearean text is, is that you can discuss that. That While Shakespeare might have wanted to portray this as significant, as a modern reader, I find this more significant. And that shows your engagement with the text. So that's really important to do as well. How do I view this theme um, today? So that's what I said. Do you view it differently? Do you, as a person with your experiences, view it differently? Would you view it differently to me as a slightly older female? Um, do you view it differently as a member of a marginalised community? So that's going to be really important to consider if you want to do well. Um, how can I see this in my own life or the world around me? So a classic is the Donald Trump and the North Korea reference, but can you see it in a smaller more relevant way um, when you are being expected to do something at school does it reflect power when people um, expect you to do something in a certain way does it show not so much corruption um, but that presence of power in your life or whatever the theme is good and evil etc when you're forced to make some form of small moral decision in your life it doesn't always have to be donald trump okay please plus 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 um and then when you have done all those reflections it leads you to this larger one which is what can i learn from my study of this theme what is 
the author's intentions and if not his intentions what have I gained otherwise anyway um, what reflections have I made and what have those led me to understand or intellectualize or just if I can't even put it all together what questions has it forced me to think about so I'll show that in the next slide because I've been forced to think about a lot of things when I was thinking about things. So you can post questions in your essays and that actually shows a level of engagement um, and that can help you do well. As a marker, um, that is something that shows an intellect <laughs> an intellectualizing of the content and an engagement and that can help to lift you from a simple thing like an A4 into an M5. So um, me trying to evaluate my theme. If you want to listen to me prattle for about five more minutes, that will come up. But otherwise, I would come back to this bit of the video, um, back to the slide, and evaluate your theme. Do a small bit of reflection. If your brain's switched on enough to do it today, do it. If not, come back to this at another point in time, because evaluating your theme will undoubtedly improve your grade. Okay, Just saying this shows this theme is never going to get you to the same extent as processing these sort of questions and reflections and writing them down and then coming back to them and putting them in your essays at another point in time. So um, I tried to have a little bit of a consideration of it. And when I was thinking about power um, through the characters uh, to start, I found going back and thinking about events was hard. But if I thought about the characters, then the events came easier. That was just how my brain went. So I thought about power um, as it's shown through Richard and his rise to power, the impact of power, and if there was a fall. So I think when he goes into battle and he's all a horse, a horse for my kingdom, etc. I think it does show a fall. And I think when the ghosts come at the end and they're so pro-Richmond and so anti-Richard, I think that does reflect a fall in his character. Um, does Lady Anne have any power? Is she submitting power to be with him or is she... You know, does she have power at all at any point in that scene? I thought that was a worthy point for reflection. Um, Buckingham, what role does he play when exploring the idea of power? Is he powerless because he ultimately does everything that Richard wants? Um, or is he a part of that power? He does it because he's his friend and maybe he wants to see Richard thrive and maybe he's a little bit evil too. But he also is going to always meant to gain something from it. So earlier, and I think of all right, two-ish, um, he... It was promised by Richard that when all this is done, I will give you these uh, items, but also this title. And then in Act 4, Scene 2, I'm pretty confident that um, we suddenly see Richard being like ignoring him and not allowing that and saying that he's not in a giving mood at that point in time. So, yeah, what does that show us about not only Richard's attitude from his power, but Buckingham's loss of power and loss of um, prestige in that moment? Um, sorry, there's a plane in the sky and I got distracted. I haven't seen many of them. Okay, power drives people to do radical acts. Um, that's one of my thematic statements that I came up with. And then when I reflected on it further, I think it's shrouded with subjectivity. So as an audience member, I view Richard's acts as radical. He's killing off family members <laughs> left, right and centre. He's threatening people. Um, he's wooing people in kind of morally and ethically corrupt ways. Um, he's getting children murdered and he wants to marry his niece. I cannot get over that last. But um, does he view that as radical? And would the audience at the time view them as radical? They would find extents to the radicalness. Um, and then I was thinking about how that thematic statement leads to the next one about power corrupting um, and the idea that power develops and the theme develops. And so if I was thinking about trying to write as an umbrella theme, what umbrella theme um, encapsulates both of those best, not only the acts but the corruption? And so then I was thinking that perhaps corruption covers the acts in itself, that the acts are a reflection of corruption. So that was me having a think about that. Um, then I started thinking about the paranoia. Um, so once he has the crown, he um, doesn't feel like it's secure. He keeps going like for now, for now, and that's why he wants the kids killed, and that's what leads into the big bad Buckingham one. Um, so that's really important, um, this idea that there is a lack of security, even at the end of Act 1, Scene 2. Um, was ever a woman in this humour one, I can't remember the full quote now, um, I have her but for how long, effectively, when he's talking about Lady Anne. So there's never a security, and maybe that comes for Richard because he's done so many bad things to ruin the security for others um, that he knows that. And so I think that's uh, an interesting thing to think about. 
um, and that it links to the fact that power corrupts absolutely um, because when you're in a position of corruption, then obviously that insecurity is going to rise because you gained that. It's like if you are with somebody that cheated on their partner to be with you, you've done something corrupt, they've done something corrupt. So you're insecure in theory in that relationship because if they were willing to cheat on their partner to be with you, or would they not be willing to cheat on you because they've already done it before? So it's kind of like that sort of idea with his power. So he's done bad things to get to this power. So what's that to stop other people doing bad things to take that power away from him? Prattle, prattle, prattle. Um, power is never secure, which leads to corrupt behavior. But what comes first? Is it the corrupt behavior that gets you the power that then leads to the paranoia? Or the insecurity, which leads you to do corrupt things to get the power? It's kind of this like round and round circles thing. Um, as I've said before, power at the time of writing would have been viewed in a very different way. Um, and it kind of, you've got to remember that this was a play that was written for Queen Elizabeth at the time, who was from the opposition family to Richard. So it's obviously going to paint him in a more negative light. Um, and so I think they would view that kind of power hungry thing as really negative. Um, but it's remember that that had been led or created or curated the image of his rise to power and desire and greed. Power at the time of reading, um, as I said before, that leads that his power ultimately link, leads the links with the acts that he did to get that power. And I think that, as I said at the top there, is shrouded with subjectivity. Um, and then as a reader, do I think it's right? No. Do I kind of understand where he's coming from? No. Um, but we talked about in class about incels, so the involuntary celibates and how they view themselves as terrible um, or they view themselves as women think they're terrible. And so that drives them to doing bizarre and crazy things. And Richard's own sense of insecurity about his appearance, does that allow him to do that? Does it make his rise to power and desire for power more um, sympathetic from the audience? Like, arguably. Um, but then as a more modern woman looking at that, I just see it like an incel, that there's a man who's got plenty of privilege and plenty of else going on in his life and just uses that as an excuse. And finally, to end my, la my rant, what do I learn from looking at power? Um, well, that's kind of what you've heard from all the questions that I've come from it. I learned that power corrupts those who have it and where that corruption comes from. Um, but as I just said before, the the desire for power is something that I would reflect further on because I think that's really significant when you're evaluating it. Cool. <laughs> so um, that's my long video. The first parts are the tasks and the idea of ideas versus themes. That's the most important thing to take away. But if you are looking to improve your grades, undeniably try to evaluate because as you can hear from the last five minutes of me prattling, um, you've got to try to flesh it out and you've got to try like pull away the strands and take it away from just being a generic statement to something that you've genuinely thought about. Um, because that sort of engagement and intellectual engagement with the text not only makes it more enjoyable, trust me, it does, I know you're dying, um, but it also makes you more reflective on the world around you. Um, and it does produce, if you're looking at an assessment goal at the end, it does produce better grades. Cool. Thank you for listening. Um, hopefully you have learned something or else you just think I'm crazy and that's fine. Adios.